We want to welcome everybody this evening. Um, I'm here this evening with Racheli Shpekar Frankel and Rabbi Alush. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that everybody will take a moment to go look at our bios. It's in the uh, speaker section down below, and you can get a little bit of a better sense of who we are and what we are. I just wanted to frame our conversation before we get going this evening. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe you should say from where we're speaking. I think at the moment, guess, Rabbi Alush is in Arizona. I'm in London. You're in New York. Our uh, chat is from Israel. So exactly. Around We're around the world. We are hopefully crossing lots of cultural barriers, lots of time barriers. Um, so if anybody could figure out exactly what time it is um, in our various locations, we'll give an extra extra 10 points here. Um, we really wanted to start this conversation by thinking about the family and thinking about um, parenting and parenting children in complicated worlds that we find ourselves in today, but also recognizing that hafuchba the hafuchba, um, if you turn the Torah over and over, we will always find the same struggles and come back to the same Torah values. And how can we as parents um, in the modern world also contend and help our children as they um, look for and aspire to be connected to the Misora that we hold so dear um, and make the Misora something that they can hold um, relevant to us. I had the opportunity um, this morning to actually listen to a podcast by Rabbi Neet Henkin. Um, she was interviewed about her son, and I was thinking about how appropriate it is to start this uh, keynote addressed, um, noting that that so much of this is her dream. And when they were interviewing her to give a little bit of a background about herself, she said, above and beyond, I am a grandmother and I am a mother. Um, and that she could have spoke so much about her scholarship, but what motivates her and what motivates us tonight um, and what motivates this whole conference is Torah values that center around family and relationships. And so, I want to start by opening up this question of how is it, how can we think thoughtfully as parents about allowing space for the modern world that exists today and at the same time holding Torah values? How do we impart those Torah values? How do we help our children really feel connected to Torah values? Um, and how do we do that in a thoughtful, intentional, and misora way? <laughs> Rachel, I'll let you begin. No, no, I'll let Rabbi. you begin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just th start with a little comment and then you go. Uh, listening to, to the quote from Ravnit Penkin, um, I, I feel the need to say that this would be true for every great uh, leader and scholar in our, I think in, in Judaism at all, but uh, altogether, but uh, definitely in our generation. Um, one might think that this is in the context of Torah lo learning for women and the huge project of, uh, of Yotzot and you know, what, what Rabbi Tenkin is all about. But I, I don't think um, I, I would, I, I can imagine a great uh, Jewish persona that doesn't define themselves first and foremost uh, through the obligation to their to their to their children, to their grandchildren, to their family, actually to their to their uh, grandparents, and and see the, their their core existence uh, as a family as as the top priority. I, I think the Torah just like speaks volumes of that, and and any way you look at it, it's. You know, one might be mistaken that in uh, in such a convention that has to do with uh, women's, women's, women's uh, Torah and issues and whatever, a statement like that would be in the context of, uh, of course, being, uh, being a woman, etc. But it, it's about being a Jew. It's about it's about family values as as the core values of uh, of being Jewish. So uh, that's just uh, my my take on what you just said, uh, Sarah. And now I'm going to hear what Ravelush wants to say. No, you can please please continue, here, Kelly. Look, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think that a, a, any person should first and foremost define themselves as a family person. As a uh, as a mensch, that's what the foundation is all about. Uh, you know, uh, not to compare, but the Henkin is a giant. Um, but on a different level, I, I remember meeting Antonin Scalia, one of the Supreme Court justices in um, in America. Allah shalom, a blessed memory, if we may say. 
And he he was, uh, I, I was telling him that I'm a father of, uh, at the time, nine children. I'm a father of 10 children. And he says to me, you should know, whenever they ask me for biography, the first thing I write is that I'm a father of nine children. Then I speak about my career. And I love that. Because to, to one of the big ideas uh, to maintain uh, or, or to, to stay in the context of that you just draw Sarah, that you just drew Sarah, but uh, you know, I'm just reminded of the, of the French quote that says, le plus ça change, le plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more things stay the same. And I have a dear friend, Rabbi Daniel Lampin from Seattle, who uh, has a little uh, paraphrasing to do on this quote. And he says that the more things change, not the more things stay the same, but the more things change, the more we rely on those things that do not change. Yeah. And in a way, I think that uh, it, it's a powerful paraphrasing that speaks to what Rabbanit Henkin was saying. And it speaks to the way we have to deal with this age of distraction because things are changing all the time around us on so many levels. And the big question is, how are we going to provide for our children some sanity and some stability during this type of of, of age that we live in. And I think that we have to remind our children, perhaps this is fundamental, that there are foundations that are something that does not change. The values that we, we imbue in our homes are things that do not change. And the more those waves are hitting on our doors, I think the more we will feel the need to cling onto those things that do not change, to have an anchor in life, that will indeed provide that stability, that uh, level of, of, of warmth and of love that we all uh, desire and that we all need, especially in times that uh, are filled with change. So I would say that's, that's just the first thought that comes to mind. I, I, I will say that maybe the thing that does not change, that never changes, maybe that's the root of it all, is the divine soul. Maybe um, emphasizing to our children that no matter what they go through, they have a divine soul that is their very core, that in and of itself is may, maybe the most empowering idea that we can convey to them. You know, we just read, just, just and please stop me if I speak too much, but we just read, Kedoshim to you, it's, it's unbelievable because, you know, Moses didn't uh, address the entire nation all the time. He would speak the laws of the Torah to Yoshua and Yoshua would then teach them to, to the children of Israel. But uh, for very few instances, uh, Moses addressed the entire nation. On Mount Sinai, he addressed the entire nation. But then again, when he comes to convey this commandment of Gedoshim to you, that God tells him to speak to the entire nation. And when he speaks to the entire nation, he's, he needs to tell them the Kedoshim to you. Why? Why is that a commandment that deserves the intention of the entire nation? And I believe the answer is because God, uh, Moses had to convey to them th that which is at the very foundation of every human being, the foundation that they must, must define themselves with. And that is, Kedoshim to you, you are holy. No matter what happens to you in life, no matter how you choose to define yourself, at the very core, there's only one definition to a human being, and that is, I am holy. You know, I, I, I once spoke about a linguistic revolution that I think needs to happen. And that is, it's, it's just fascinating to me that in English, at least, when we have a physical disease, what do we say? We say, I have. So I have the flu. I have COVID, right? When we speak of mental diseases, what do we say? I we am. say, I am. I am bipolar. I am schizophrenic. And that's astounding to me. It's horrific to me. Why do we define ourselves by mental diseases? We've at least agreed that we are not a physical diseases, but we're not a mental diseases either. We should say, I have schizophrenia, not a, I am schizophrenic. And that is because, again, the very foundation of the human being, the very core of the human being cannot be defined. It's divine. Div divine means infinite. And infinite means holy. And therefore, we have to emphasize to our children that they are not the mental diseases. They are not the changes. They are not whatever mood they're in. They are holy. Kedoshim to you. And I think that idea in and of itself will empower them and will remind them that um, they have a holy calling to follow. Just to add, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let Rachel speak, but I'm also thinking of uh, uh, Rabbi Dr. Abraham J. Tworsky, who writes so powerfully that one of the most 
uh, brilliant educational tips that he received from his own parents was when he would misbehave. When he would misbehave, his parents would call him. And the only thing they would tell him is, it's pasnished, the Yiddish expression of, it's unbecoming of you. And he says that was the most brilliant educational tip that he ever received. Why? Because it conveyed to him as a child that although he was misbehaving, that behavior did not define him. He was up here, and that behavior was down here, and therefore it was unbecoming of him. It's pasnished. But the more we emphasize to our children that they are indeed holy, I think that's what they need the most, especially with the, the generation that, and the statistics about that, where the self-esteem is so low, the more we emphasize that they're holy. They cannot be defined by, by the outside circumstances, but rather by their holiness, the more they follow that call to be holy, the more they'll create holy lives too. It's like Racheli said when, she, when, when we had the privilege and the honor of having her year in Arizona, I remember that line, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Racheli, but you said that I can be in tears, but I don't become my tears. I can be in pain, but I don't become my pain. And that's so true for a generation that uh, has all these definitions uh, uh, jumping all over them. But they should remember that I am holy. That's who they truly are. They can become their tears. They can become their moods. They can become their mental diseases. They can only become that holiness that is a part of the very core. Wow. Um, uh, Sarah, is the, you're a psychologist, and, and I, I'm thinking how the words of Rabbi Alush relate to the, to the eating disorders that, uh, that you deal with. This uh, uh, being able to, to separate between a core that has endless worth and, and endless esteem and, and, you know, and, and deserve endless love and, and actually a, uh, is showered by divine love. But you know, it, it's the big frustration about uh, such problems as you deal with uh, day to day is that a person could be showered with love and, and they, don't, they don't accept it because something's mi missing in that um, uh, understanding of the core or acceptance of the core that uh, Rabbi Elush was, uh, was describing. I, I'm sure it related directly to, to you know, professionally to, to the things that you know. Well, it's funny. I was thinking about, about turning the question to both of you a little bit, because one of the things I, I think a lot about, um, you're right, Racheli, is this idea that it's become, and Rabbi Elush, you, you mentioned it um, very clearly, but I think a little bit subtly, and I want to bring it to the forefront, which is we talk so much in the world of parenting, particularly as it relates to religion, about this idea of constancy and consistency, and that parents have an obligation to walk the walk that they talk. In other words, that if they um, are saying something Thing, but it doesn't match up to their actions. Children very much pick up on it. This idea that children not only take from us the things that we say, but the things that we don't say, the things that we think that they're saying. So often children are making assumptions. Um, and there's amazing, wonderful literature and a little bit humbling literature about this idea that if a, if a child thinks that their parent is thinking something, even if they say something else, the thought holds so powerful to them. And trying to think about this idea that's a balancing act. On the one hand, we've spent so much time modeling and thinking about how do parents model Torah values, but I wonder larger issues today have to shift the focus to helping parents talk and articulate in a very real way not only the values, but making a space in their home and in their relationship with their children so that their children can feel comfortable that their parents aren't scared of their thoughts, their parents aren't scared of their questions, and wondering, you know, oftentimes if parents almost, and helping to break the barrier so that children don't feel that if they have questions about their parents' Torah values or the way that they're thinking about Torah and um, a battle, right? They're not coming to the table trying to fight and then the parents get into a power struggle, but really making space for this parenting, larger parenting idea, which is children want to succeed. They want to be connected to their parents. They want to follow in their parents' values, but our parents and how can parents and how can we help parents think about feeling more confident to use their language to talk about those Torah values? So um, it, it's interesting because it seems like 
uh, you're describing that uh, a lot of the problem would be confrontations and, and misguided battles. And I feel that often it's the other way around. Uh, you find parents that are very involved in, you know, uh, their, their, their child's academic achievement, and they have very strong opinions about that. And why did you do this? And why you should, et cetera, et cetera. And then when it comes to value judgment and, and even not even directly religious decisions, but, but value decisions, uh, suddenly the parents become very, very humble. And they feel they're not allowed and it's illegitimate to, to express their opinion. And, and there the gap of what you imagine a parent says and would have said and should have said and what the parents feel they're saying is huge because um, the parent is saying, oh, he's part of this culture and in his campus they learn this and then online they say that and I, I shouldn't be interfering in that stuff. And the, the, the child on the one hand is, or not necessarily a child, could be a student, could be a young adult, has a very, very uh, strong influence by, by um, current uh, culture and, and whatever is surrounding it. And there is a very strong expectation to hear what my parent would say, and my parent refrains from saying. And, you know, I, I'm not saying dictate to your child what to do, but at least pose the dilemma, talk about the two sides of the issue, talk about what, in your opinion, uh, a proper decision might be or the Torah way might be, and you know, present the other side of the dilemma too. But this idea of, um, it, it's not even a, a, you know, they used to talk about uh, the problem of, uh, of parents who, who can't use authority because we were scared of authoritarian uh, parenting. It's not even that. It's this dismissal of my own place and my own views and my own beliefs in, in, in fear of, of a very prominent and dominant uh, outer culture. And it's as if I can tell them, uh, you know, academically, go do whatever, I can get upset. But I can't say a word about a value judgment, about, about a mitzvah, about, uh, about Torah. Uh, sometimes, I, I'm not saying that this is a, 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 you know, everybody has this, this side of the problem, but often you find that. You find that parents uh, just refrain from expressing their opinions Probably even a though they bit. have opinions. I think of it a little bit, Chali, as are we setting our children up for Torah value, misara success? Right, we set them up for success in so many other ways by very clearly stating our expectations or the way we conceptualize and think about these things. Are we setting our children up today enough, and how can we help parents do it more? Would be right. the way I think about it, Rabbi Alush. So, uh, look, I I, I want to go even a, a step further and be even more aggressive. First of all, I agree that modeling is key. Uh, you said that. Parents spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on education, and then they ruin it all by jumping over the gate at an amusement park to save $5. <laughs> but it's true. I think modeling is key. I also think that direct instructions and, and, and conversation is also key. But I would go a step further, and I would actually um, transform my passive child who might be receiving my words and learning from my modeling to an active child who is a participant in the values that I try myself to teach and to embody. So for example, if you are visiting the sick, take your child with you. If you are inviting someone for Shabbat dinner, have your child be a participant of that and maybe have him share a story during Shabbat dinner. I think the more we transform our children into active doers in the values that we try to teach them, the more those values in a way that really make an impact in this world you know I, I speaking of living in an age with so many distractions i'm again reminded of the story with the late lubavitcher rebbe of blessed memory was once approached and i think it's on video he was once approached by a rabbi during the famous you know sunday dollars that he would give to people they would then have to give to charity they would keep the dollars to themselves of course because the rabbi touched them but they would give other dollars to charity by the way it's interesting but the Rebbe would give a dollar, not just give blessings. 
because he would say that there can't be a situation in which two people meet and the third person doesn't benefit from it. And therefore he gave that dollar. But anyway, there's, I think it's some video. There was a rabbi who came and asked the rabbi the, rabbi the simple question of, how come uh, you're not afraid of sending all of your emissaries across the world where there are so many temptations and all sorts of distractions? Um, they, might, they, they might be influenced. And the rabbi said to the rabbi, knowing very well who he was speaking to, well, I'm surprised. It's actually a halacha in Shulchan Aruch. It's, 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 it's a law in the Torah. So what halacha are you referring to? This is a halacha in, uh, in, in Hilchas Melicha, in the salting of the meat. What's the halacha? It's called the Aidi de Palit Lobali. That as long as a piece of meat is extracting its blood through the salting, it can't swallow any foreign, foreign matter. So as long as my emissaries are giving of themselves and are really doing everything in their power to make an impact, they won't be able to swallow anything. So I, I would go again, go a step further and, and, and tell all parents out there what I, I try to do myself is involve your children in being active doers. And that's the best way to impart in them, on them the, the values that we want to impart. Truth is the, the issue of um passiveness and activeness is, is a major issue here. Because first of all, you know, when, when you talk about teenagers, you might feel, and again, every household is different, but, but you know, reality, especially with COVID and Zooms, things, you know, places where it wasn't like that, it became like that, where um, you think you're raising the child, but the teenager spends X amount of, uh, of hours in a closed room, and it's, another world that's raising them and influencing them and becoming, uh, in, in extreme cases, their, their peer group, et cetera. And, and the whole notion of communicating and, and discussing and opening conversation and turning you into active becomes, uh, it, it, it's not the default anymore. The default becomes uh, very passive, very uh, uninvolved, and, and, if, and you hear parents saying, I, I, I feel like I need to go in through the cracks, you know, and, and, and most of the time and most of the energy and most of the attention are not in those rare times when we meet. So, so um, being aware of the, the, the passive active uh, balance and, and proper conversation and opportunities for proper conversation is, is no longer the, the default. It's, it's, it's the major thing. It's like it, you need special attention to make sure this happens. That, that's one issue. The other is sometimes, you know, beyond the, the, the core family, you, you have a, a child who's, uh, you know, a little bit grown up and they're out on a, on a campus. And this is a, a very well, like you said, everybody wants to be successful. Most people want to continue their, their parents' way. And, and you know, this, this really nice kid goes out to the, to the campus and he tells himself, I'm, I'm going to continue to be a wonderful Jew. Yeah, yes, I'm going to hear all these amazing uh, ideas, but I, I'm not going to change. And the key to, of course, you want a person to change. You want a person to grow. You want a person to really get an education. But the key to uh, holding on to core identity and core vo values has to do with activity. It's, you know, you, you can't be a Jew at heart. <laughs> you, it's not enough. It's, it's about going ahead and doing stuff and initiating stuff and, and being very, very aware of it. Um, even you know, once you open this whole field of campuses, it's some of the ideas that you that you are exposed to are are very threatening and and so dominant that these days with you know everything that has to do with the political correctness, etc., you can't even speak out again. You know, you, you started out with quoting uh, Justice Scalia. Can you yeah. really speak on a campus about having, thank God, a, a, a big family? I don't know, you're part of the environmental crisis. Um, it's simple things that five minutes ago were simple truths and, and you know, being able to say clearly, yes, we are pro big happy families. Not big al cheshbon, you know, uh, coming at the expense of the happiness, but no, as, as big as and happy as, as, as the, the parents could, uh, could handle. Can a student on a campus today say that freely? Uh, it's not so clear that they can. So once they can't even discuss a lot of their major uh, values, it, it's very, 
it, it's really up to the question of how active are you going to be? Uh, what kind of initiatives are you going to start? What kind of company are you going to keep? Um, even if you really want to go through this journey of, of exploring different opinions. And that's what the Academy is about. I mean, at least it used to be about trying out different ideas and truly listening to a variety of ideas. That's fine as long as you start out your journey with a commitment. You say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to learn. I'm willing to listen, but I'm a Jew of Shulchan Aruch. I'm, I'm, I'm committed in my active way of life, not in a passive way, in an active way of life to, to guidelines. And, and yes, you, you can shield people and you don't want always to shield people from, from uh, a lot of the growth that comes with being exposed to the outside culture. Right. I, I think a little bit also just to, just to piggyback that and maybe frame it for a little bit of a question for Rabbi Alush to kind of take, um, uh, off with is I think one of the struggles that we're hearing about is the fact that life is not simple. And how do we reflect to our children the fact that we as parents might struggle with certain aspects, but it doesn't necessarily minimize our commitment. We think about the fact that maybe the cultural trend of the current world is that, you know, everything's fine and everything works and everything, you know, there are no limits. And what would it be like to communicate to children that there are limitations but our limitations are connected to our Mesorah, which is everlasting and which is boundless and which is constantly in and of itself holding a tension between multiple truths. And yet we coalesce around one. So just thinking about it from a more simplistic perspective, how do we allow our children to feel like they have a role model of parents who are acknowledging that there are expectations, that there are limits, and that they feel that they have a strong grounding place from which they can explore from, right? You're talking about this idea that they're going out into the world, but how can we as a family and as um, parents create a base of expectations, noting limitations, and also allowing for there to be a place that kids can come back to with questions and that we as parents are not scared of their questions. Their questions are not going to scare us. Their questions are going to enhance the dialogue that we have with them about those values. Right. Um, look, I, I just want to uh, maybe maybe follow up on also what Racheli was saying before and at the same time relate to this question, but I... I'm just reminded, maybe with this illustration, it will give us a better uh, idea of, of a tool that we can use. But I'm reminded of Viktor Frankl, you know, the author of Man's Search for Meaning, who apparently visited the United States of America in the early 60s from Austria, where he came from. And uh, they told him that there's a Statue of Liberty that the Americans are very proud, proud about because uh, it represents their liberty. And he immediately responded, well, that's nice to have a Statue of Liberty to represent your liberty but I think that you also need a statue of responsibility because liberty without responsibility creates chaos. It's not liberty. And then he added, and I don't want to offend anyone, but that's, um, if I have to quote Viktor Frankl, I'm going <laughs> to quote Viktor Frankl. He said, maybe we should erect this statue of responsibility off the coast of California. But in any case, <laughs> in any case, the idea is that indeed with liberty, without responsibility, without a structure does not, does not, give room to liberty, it gives room to, to chaos. And I think that in the way when we convey that to our children, that the Torah is there, God forbid, not to impose rules, but to create a structure for indeed that holiness to thrive and for liberty to, to endure, then I think they can relate to that. I use, you know, every parent I'm sure has his own way to communicate with his children, but I have a, a teenager who's a big football fan. And the example I use is that, you know, without the football rules, without the four you know, the four downs, et cetera, they wouldn't be a football game. And the Torah in a way is that, is that structure that then provides the fun of the game, so to speak, or the meaning of life uh, in the words of, of Viktor Frankl. That's number one. Number two, I just want to add one more thing. And I think that again, it connects to what we spoke about before, recon uh, enabling our children to recognize that they have a calling, a calling of holiness, that they they were sent to this world for a very holy mission. And that mission is on campuses. That mission is in the supermarket that they visit. That mission is even at the gas station when they fill up gas. That mission is everywhere. 
Our soul does not rest from its mission. And the more we make them active participants or active doers, like we were saying before, in enabling to, to, to actualize, in enabling them to, to actualize that mission, I think the more the divine soul will be satisfied and the more they will also uh, shine that divine soul for the world to see. So I think it also very much depends on that. Um, you know, there's a great story. I don't mean to bore you with too many stories, but there's a great story about the previous Lubavitcher Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson of Blessed Memory, who was fundraising for his institute. And then they told him there's a Jew in Chicago that is very successful in the shmata business, uh, but he wouldn't give a dime. So he went to visit him. He knew that this Jew came, I think, from Riga, Latvia. And he said to him, hey, I came because I have a very loose button. You're on my coat. Can you come and fix it? He says, are you pulling a joke on me? What are you saying? He says, yes, just fix this button. He says, I, I'm, I'm not going to fix this button. This is a joke. He says, you're right. It's, it's not a joke, but it's a message I want to convey. You think you came all the way from Riga, Latvia to come and uh, build this uh, old uh, schmatter business just to be able to, to fix a button here and fix a button there? You think now that your soul came from millions of miles away to this world to fix a button here, to open a shmata business there and to do that. It came to help institutes. It came to create holiness in this world. And you're wasting your time fixing buttons. And in a way, I think that's, that's a powerful message. Our children didn't come on earth just to fix buttons, just to open shmata business. Our children came on earth to fulfill a divine mission, whether it's to be God's representative on the campus or whether it's to be that person that smiles when no one smiles at the, at the supermarket. But, but I think the more we emphasize that, the better it is also. Why are parents afraid to say that? Why, why is it that, that even if we deeply believe in, in the things that uh, are said, uh, somehow we're afraid to impose that on our children? Now, I'm, I'm on your side. I would sit right beside you and say exactly the same stuff, maybe with less Lubavitcher examples, but whatever. <laughs> um, I, I'm 100% with you. Why do you so often find parents that are, they feel it's not their role. They feel it's not, you know, it's, uh, I can't impose it. It's, let, it's their life. It's their journey. And of course, you're not imposing. You're just you're tempting, you know, you're inviting, you're, you're empowering, you're saying, wow, look what, what you're capable of doing. And still, it, it, for, for so many parents, it's, it's, they don't touch that. They, they don't have the confidence to present that idea to their children. Right. Uh, uh, why I personally feel, I'm going to generalize, I think every parent has his own reason, but I think that because of the life that we live in, that focuses too much on the what's, to fo focuses too much on the how's, and too little on the why. You know, the Nietzsche, it's not a Lubavitcher. Frederick Nietzsche was not a Lubavitcher. <laughs> Go ahead. <Frederick> when, Nietzsche. <laughs> when... <laughs> we'll allow it. <laughs> Frederick Nietzsche famously said that if, if you know the why, then you'll be, I'm not quoting verbatim, but if you know the why, you'll be able to deal with almost any how, right? I think we don't focus enough on the why. I, I really don't. I don't see it not in schools. I don't see it not in synagogues. And I'm a rabbi of a synagogue. And I don't see it in the non-Jewish world either. There's no discussion of the why, maybe very little discussion on the why. Why are we sent here? Why, why, why do we even live? Why did God give us a new day today when we woke up in the morning? There's no discussion of that. So we speak a lot about the what's in the house. I think the more homes will speak about the why, the easier that discussion will come to be. How do you both think about this idea of imparting, you both have... Um, Baruch Hashem, lots of children, and I'm sure lots of different types of different children. Um, how do you balance the role um, and thinking about each of the different children as individuals versus the collective family um, in imparting their whys? Is it one why? Is it many little whys? Um, how do parents? How do parents do that? How do they balance their their children and their families? In in your opinions, right. <laughs> Um, I'll just say, you know, uh, when you said your children are young, um, you see they're born with their own character. You know, it's uh, our greatest mission is, is not to cause any damage, you know, to, to, to help them uh, uh, blossom into their, you know, the best they can be without spoiling anything. But they each are born with their, with their character. 
and and eventually you're it's it's a different family for each one of them it's you, you can say no they all had the same parents the same family no it's 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 the location in the family it's the character it's their interests it's their talent it, 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 every set of relationship is is a new and here again it's 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 a it's a delicate balance between a parent having the confidence to say this is our world this is our family this is uh, the way we understand things or Abba understands, Ima understands, um, and and have have the confidence of at least thinking about themselves. Not not saying what the kid has to do, but if I were in your your situation, I would understand. You know, from one hand, this is this is a dilemma. There's a one side. There is another side. Uh, I might have a tendency to, to. It's your decision, but I, I I feel like I'm repeating myself. But but I often uh, encounter this phenomena of uh, parents annulling themselves. And you were asking about, you know, the different versions of a child that you get in, the, in a family. And eventually, you know, every parent is usually, most of the time, when we're at our best, we're attentive to the specific needs and, and uh, qualities that we feel from this specific child. But, but we have to present our own, you know, we have to present where we come from. And, and it comes out very, very different with every child. It's not, it's, it's not co copied. It, it's definitely not copy paste from, from child to child. I think it's, it's often challenged when, when you, and we all in one way or the other meet it, when, when one of the children or the first of the per children to challenge the, the standard that you thought you, you're setting for the family. I know everybody was very young and everybody was listening to Uncle Moishi and doing exactly what you want. And, uh, you know, your dream Shulchan Shabbat. And, and, and then, you know, they, they, they start challenging that. And, and some of the dilemmas are uh, how the choices of one child affect the whole family environment, okay? And, and here I find the, the language that Rabbi Alush is uh, presenting, um, it's still challenging, but it, but it, it becomes, a, again, a very um, powerful tool because, you know, it, sometimes just saying about this is what, what's done in our family and what's not done, in, it, it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. But, but this, this uh, attempt to approach the neshama directly, you know, saying uh, you have a world of potential, a world of expectations, and you too, you know, you have your own world of potential and expectations and his choices are his, are his choices and your choices. And I, I'm still the parent with my worldview. Um, it, it becomes a very complex uh, juggling uh, show, but right. at some point it, it's, it's no longer about uh, what you do or not do, how you dress or not, you know, it, it, it's about, I, I presume you have the best of intentions. I, I, I know you have the best of potential. And, and I'll continue to relate to you directly like that. And the way I relate to you when I, when I went through the other children, I, I, I will never show the judgment uh, of one child. Uh, if I can't help it, I would never uh, uh, show it to, 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 through another child. I, I'm not, my English isn't clear enough, but uh, no, I think I think I hear what you're saying, and it's really quite beautiful. And you 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 said I'm repeating your, myself, but you're really not because what you're really coming back to is what I hear you pointing out so powerfully is the fact that positive parenting and inspiring our children's deepest sense of soul and ideal also comes from the fact that parents have to work on themselves. Parents also, as part of their parenting avodah, as part of their parenting work, have to be working on themselves to identify and ground themselves in what their values are and to feel confident enough to portray those values to their children. It's a really different way of thinking about parenting in this complicated world. It's challenging parents to be better, better selves as well, if I if I hear what you're exactly. saying, and I think Rabbi Luch is alluding to yes. it also. Yes, and and when we say work on there's there's something uh, about a very dominant culture that 
uh, automatically makes us apologetic. And that's not a good place to be a parent from. When, you know, apologizing for, for, for holding on to, no, it's, okay, I, I, uh, this, now I, I'm going after Rabbi Alush, I'll, I'll quote, uh, I'll quote of Steinsatz, okay? Okay, amazing. Uh, <laughs> we'll come full circle here. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, there's um, an interview with, uh, with Ravadin, could easily be found uh, online, where he describes how uh, at a very young age, uh, early 20s, and he himself was a bunch of sorts. He, he had a strong family, but, but he, he, he had a, his, his own way and uh, his, his original uh, upbringing wasn't uh, extremely religious. And um, he found, he, he was learning for a few years and he found himself uh, teaching Torah to a bunch of 70 year old professors. And he, and he says there, what am I this 20 something kid uh, gonna, gonna say to these 70 year old professors? And then he says, and then I realized I'm just a pipeline. I'm channeling a Torah that's 3000 years old. So it's not 20 year old here, it's 3000 year old. It's not old 70 year olds, it's ancient 3000 year old. And there's something about the confidence that comes with that, you know, not, 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 um, it's always with humility and it's always with, on the contrary, it goes together. You say, on the one hand, it's a 3000 year old Torah and it's Dvar Hashem and it's not, on the other hand, it's not, it's not me. It's not even up to me. It's, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, so there's a, there's a confidence and a humility that come together. And in that sense, I say, this, this culture and especially this current culture is working very hard uh, to turn us to, uh, very silent and very apologetic. And in, in the context of family, that's a crime, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, we have a dear congregant, a dear friend of ours here who's an expert in autism. Uh, he has the Melmud Center, some of you may, may have heard of it, but his name is Dr. Ron Melmud. And he often says that parents have to realize that children don't come from us, they come through us. And it's consistent, by the way, with the words of the prophet, that before I created you in your womb, before I formed you in your womb, I knew you. In other words, God knew us. He knew our personalities. He knew who we were even before we were born. So we had a formed personality even before we came out of the wombs of our mother. And so, so we came through our mothers not not from our mothers or from our parents and i think that's where the humility comes in recognizing that uh, we are not responsible to create an identity for our children or to create of of uh, uh, you know of 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 life goals and directions for our children we're there to really channel them each with their own strengths each with their own talents uh, that's where the confidence must come in the in the channeling and the humility must come in when we say, well, every child is different. They not, you know, Dr. Melmed, the same guy was telling me that there are tests apparently today out of Boston that you can actually know the temper of your child at the day of one day or at the age of one day old, how? So children, just, just to give you a quick example, but children, you know, little babies, if you push their heads backwards, they'll move like this, right? Now, the karma, the hot tempered personalities will move many times. That's how you can know sometimes that apparently that's what he was saying that, that, you know, what type of person, but it proves again that God already gave a personality, gave talents and skills to your child even before he was born. So it's not your duty as a parent to create those. It's your duty as a parent to channel them in the best of directions. And I think you know, it's important to remember that. Yeah, one of the things though I'm brought back to is something you mentioned earlier, um, is the fact that we also are struggling with the, with the the this expectation that sometimes children can get lost in their emotions. That whatever I'm feeling today, it is me. It, I won't be able to get out of it, and I'm stuck in it. And really trying to remind, I think, in the context of values, in the context of. Uh, how children are taking in emotions and experiences that they can feel something in the moment 
And it doesn't have to mean that they're going to feel it forever. And they can allow themselves the opportunity to expand, whether it means they're how connected they feel to Hashem in that moment, um, how disconnected they might feel or connected to the family or disconnected, that these are that these are evolving and they're not they're not determined from birth and they're not determined from 10 years old or 20 years old that the world and the family and Torah is big enough to hold their big feelings and emotions and they can change um, and, and maybe helping parents think about allowing their children to have those emotions without being scared by them. Cause I think that's, that's probably where the apologetic component comes in. They don't, they fear that if they don't acknowledge it, that the children will run away from them um, because they're scared of their thoughts. So, um, I think this goes in two directions. One is there's an, be, regarding the apologetics, there's a component of the current culture that is uh, almost uh, purposefully uh, turning people apologetic. You know, um, if there are things you're not allowed to think and things you're not allowed to say, and and this idea that anything that might be offensive to a, a you know a, a tiny tiny percentage in the world is something you're not even allowed to to experience. Um, that that you're just you you it's it's slicha that I'm here. You know I, I'm sorry right. I didn't mean that. yeah. Uh, so so that's something that um, I think has to be put out there uh, in in a bit of the, the the culture struggle we're in, and it is a struggle. I. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that uh, it's all negative. There's some amazing things going on, but um, the, the the challenge to be a free thinker, and and maybe to be able sometimes to express what you think, and not necessarily uh, get everything dictated to you, is is a big deal. So so that's part of the apologetics that has to do with the culture itself. That's how I think. And the second is, is of course, a very, uh, a very accurate, I think you're the professional, very accurate uh, psychological uh, description of, of parents being so fearful of, you know, uh, negatively affecting their children's lives. And you know, especially, you know, teenagers that sometimes are, you know, they're harsh and, and we all know that they crave boundaries, but the boundaries are there to, to bang against. And it's, it's for parents, I, I can say firsthand, it's scary, you know, when, when you get pushed and, and sometimes you'd rather have less friction. And um, so, so a lot of that is, is what you described, uh, definitely. Um, there was something I wanted to relate to what you were saying about uh, changing stages in, in faith or, uh, uh, and, and I sometimes find myself uh, describing what you might be to a friend that's going through something difficult, a loss, a tragedy, whatever. And, and there are a million things they can be going through. They can be angry, they can be, uh, you know, they can have some, uh, very extreme thoughts about their previous beliefs and, and a crisis of faith and all that. And as a friend, and that, I'm not even talking as a parent, as a friend, uh, I think the greatest message is, I'm not, you're not gonna scare me away. I'm not gonna panic. I'm not gonna disappear on you. I'm here for you. And you know, the buzzword is I'm gonna contain this and, and just be a container in, in the sense that, that you're a friend. You don't have to, you don't have to have answers. You don't have to, to be, uh, you know, um, have, have all the metaphysical answers. Just be there, be there. And, and, and they're angry, okay, go ahead, be angry. They're, they're losing their faith, okay, that's the phase at the moment. So that's, that's right. one thing. The, the other thing is um, this notion- and parents and again, have I can to have those boundaries. To your point, parents have to have those boundaries in order to contain it. If there's no boundaries and there's nothing containing it. So that reinforces both ideas that you just mentioned that parents have to feel like they can have boundaries so that they can contain the, their child's growing development and crisis and moments, right? Sure, and I, I wanna hear what other loose ones said. I, I, yes. I just, I think um, being able to say, you, you don't have to say that to a child, but uh, uh, theoretically being able to say, look, uh, 
religion and faith and emuna and where you're at is a dynamic. And uh, it's very rare that a people that people are like stone strong and they never change. And 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 it's a relationship. So sometimes you feel very close, and sometimes you feel estranged, and sometimes you have doubt. I, you know, if, if they would meet me at this stage in, of my life, I would say, you know, if there's something I learned over the years is I don't panic as much when I feel separated because I feel like a kadosh is waiting for me around the corner. Okay, I'll straighten up my act. I'll be back. But you're a young, a young person and, and you're going through this and I appreciate it. And I am who I am and I'll be here for you. And we, we as a family, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it, it's, again, you said it all. It, it's about uh, holding strong who you feel that your family is, but, but being there for them throughout their changes. Right. I, I, I wanna add to what Rocheli said and I would, uh, I would, I would add maybe two, two, two points, and they're very much connected. One point is maybe best illustrated by, you quoted Rabbi Steinsaltz before, so I remember that he came to visit us here in Scottsdale too, a few times. And during one of the times, he was approached by a parent who was having a tough time with his children, and Rabbi Steinsaltz uh, was a very wise man, and he knew when to answer and how to answer. So he didn't answer immediately. And then we were walking back to his hotel with this parent. And in Arizona, as many of you know, uh, the real estate is booming and everything's under construction all the time. And we passed by a building that was under construction that said under construction. Then he turns to this parent and he says, what do you think about this building? Is it nice? Is it to your taste? He says, I don't know, Rabbi, it's under construction. So Rabbi Schnauz then turned to him and he said, well, your child is under construction. Why are you judging him now whether he's ugly or beautiful? Everyone's under construction. And by the way, that construction ends only in our grave. It doesn't end at a certain age either. So that's number one. We have to remember that as parents, our children are under construction. Why, why judge them for, for a moment of, 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 of slipping? That's number one. Number two, I, I would also emphasize this idea that, that Rabbi Stans himself told me that you know, children who have a tough time in life should be loved more, not judged more. We have to love them as much as possible. And I remember him, him sharing with me, I think a, a beautiful thought by Rabbi Simcha Bunim of Pshischa to ask the question of why is it that when uh, Yaakov decided to go to Egypt, he first sent Yehuda to institute a uh, house of study there, right? At Yudash Arach Lefanav Goshna. Why Yehuda? Yehuda was the troublemaker of the family. Why not send someone a little more scholarly? Why Yehuda? And the answer is because Yehuda is the only one who stood up to the plate and said, Ki he was willing to take charge of Binyamin to be his guarantor. He showed that he truly loved. And you can only educate. You can only create a house of study. You can only teach if you love. You can only educate if you are willing to take responsibility, no matter what, for your children. And to be with them at all times, always. Otherwise, it, doesn't, it just doesn't go. And I think that we can't overemphasize how much we have to love our children, especially in our day and age where they are so distracted, where their self-esteem is so low, where there are so many things bombarding them from all directions, where indeed they lose belief, their own sense of belief in themselves. We have to provide that for them more than any other time, I think, in history, to love them and love them and love them. And there could be no, no end to that love. And the more we love them, I think the more they'll respond to that love. And uh, their construction will continue to grow and beautify itself. You know, I'm thinking of Ayalush, that was so beautiful. And I'm thinking of this book that's quite famous by Andrew Solomon. It's called Far From My Tree. It's a quite powerful book. He's written a number of other books after that. He talks about this idea um, um, that it's sometimes harder to relate to children that are different from us. And in his book, he talks about very extreme examples, whether it's children with physical disabilities or emotional disabilities or you know, intellectual differences that make us feel like our children are further from our tree. But in this smaller world of psychology, we've often elaborated and, and talked about the fact that sometimes children that are just either really just not, not different from us. We feel like some kids are a little more our ingredients and some kids are a little bit like, are you sure? Are you sure I housed you? Are you sure you came from my genetic you know, makeup? They somehow feel a little bit different. It's those kids that sometimes we have to remember to work a little harder 
to lean into, where it's a little bit harder. Some of our kids, um, unfortunately or fortunately, it's easier. We can relate to what they're going through easier. But I think it speaks to parents today as a reminder that you said it so beautiful. Each of our children are a neshama, are a soul. Um, even the ones, sometimes the ones that we can relate to, we can see it better. Sometimes the one that we can relate to a little best are harder to see. But that's right. where we have to lean in and love more. Um, right. those kids. It's, it's interesting right. because I, I, I just... I just had a new medrash on the, you know, the famous story with the with the uh, footprints in, footprints in the sand. So we always used to it's, it's so famous. Uh, we always used to say uh, when I was in most in trouble, then you held me in your arms. But now the the new medrash I learned from Rabbi Alush is when I was most trouble, when I made most trouble, that's when uh, you know I, I deserve the, the strongest hug. Yeah. And and right. and and you know. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You know, I'm sure you've all heard of Marion Williamson. She says that there are two types of people in the world, those who love and those who shout for love. And I think that the, those children who are in trouble are just shouting for love. And us not responding with love is a travesty in my eyes. Absolutely. I think also reminding our children where our love stems from. And I think sometimes we get lost um, in that dialogue. I think sometimes we have become, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm incorrect, but I wonder if we aren't communicating the love that we have of Torah, not just the intellectualism, not just the way the halacha guides us and the details, but balancing the details as well as the emotional relationship that one has um, with Hashem. I guess I'm thinking actually about something I just read about from Rabbi Bazak in this week's parsha, upcoming parsha about Shemitah, the laws of Shemitah repeated in this week's um, parsha. And there was a question about, you know, what, what is there a difference between the Shemitah and Shemot and the Shemitah in Bahar? Um, and he notes that, that there is an idea amongst the different ways that people understand what Shemitah is coming to teach us. Is it coming to teach us about our reliance on Hashem, that everything we have is because Hashem allowed us to have it, and that is this idea of leaving the land um, fallow in the sixth year? Or is it also about the fact that we live in a world with social justice and we want to make sure that the poor people um, have, um, have food? That there are both aspects all the time, and we have to just relate to it in different ways. Yeah. No. yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, we don't really have much time, but I was wondering, um, so one thing, one very important thing is, is to tell a parent when they're challenged and, and when they feel uh, it's, it's difficult to love, your greatest mission now is not to do chinuch, uh, not to do, you know, uh, uh, rebuke, whatever. now just love. That's a big deal to say, this is your greatest mission. But often the parent finds it very difficult at these points to, to love. And, and, here I'm, I, and here I'm, again, I'm addressing you as a psychologist. Both of the place where the parent finds it difficult to actually love, because it, it, it's such a difficult time and everything's going wrong. And, 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 and also with the kid that no matter how much love you surround them with, they, 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 don't, they don't seem to have the, the vessels to, to, to hold it, to keep it, to receive it. So it, maybe if you can say a, a word about that and uh, uh, we'll have to end soon. Well, and there, you know, I, I wanted, I'm going to answer by actually reiterating what you both have spoken about, which is, I think one of the most powerful things that we all can think about today is the fact that we're all under construction. You know, you, you so beautifully spoke about this idea that parenting is not just about what we're helping our children establish and helping our children develop, but also what we as the parents are establishing and developing ourselves. Are we spending enough time on learning and being able to impart the values because we know what our values are. Um, and at the same time, thinking about the fact that everybody is under construction, parenting is a journey. You know, I always remind parents in my own work with parents, they'll say to me, my parent, my kid came to the, came up to me and said something and I didn't know what to say to them because I, my answer was just, I had, didn't have one. So I said to them, oh, okay. And also, have you seen the beautiful weather outside? And the kid looks at them like, what? That wasn't an answer to my question, you know? And the parents just hoping, you know, go away, come back and ask me something I can answer. And I always tell parents, the best thing in that moment is go back to your child. 
Think about your answer. Go back to them in an hour, in a day and say to them, I thought about what you asked me and I froze because I was scared I didn't have the answer. But let me tell you what I've been thinking about. So powerful that the child feels that the parent thought about them, the parent held them and the parent came back to them. So I think thinking about all these beautiful ideas that everybody talks about, remembering that we're a work in progress. Our children are a work in progress. We just want to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants of us. And we know that our children really want to do what we want, which is also to feel connected to us and to feel connected to their misora, and allowing ourselves the humility, the humbleness, um, and the flexibility, I think, to remember that we don't always have to have all the answers as long as we're growing and as long as we're growing in our marriages, we're growing in our families, we're going in our relationships, then I think we'll be able to be more thoughtful, intentional um, and grow very established um, families. And you both have just shared such a wealth of knowledge, of inspiration, um, and you do it so easelessly, so seamlessly, so beautifully, and I think so inspiring. So. Um, thank you both so much for inspiring us tonight. You know, when, when people say such nice words, they say, come tell it to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I say, say it to my mother. She'll believe you. <laughs> that, that's even better. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Everybody. Okay, thank, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov.